Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back. In this segment, we're going to talk about the gradient descent algorithm, uh, which is widely applied in machine learning to help calibrate the parameters uh, of a model. And um, before we start, just a few things that we want to recall uh, from our discussion in prior segments. First off, uh, the gradient is a type of vector, and like any vector, uh, it has a magnitude and a direction for our purposes. Uh, the direction is really going to be what's most important. Um, the gradient vector itself is the vector of partial derivatives for a multivariate function. It's a function with more than uh, one independent variable. And in the case where we have a three-dimensional function, where we have three variables, z, x, and y, uh, we can think about computing the gradient of this function f by just taking the partial derivative with respect to x, making that the x-coordinate, and then taking the partial derivative with respect to y, making that the y-coordinate. So when we're looking at the gradient vector here, what this is actually telling us is the slope of the function, the three-dimensional function in the x-direction. Okay, and the second coordinate here measures the slope of that three-dimensional function in the y-direction. Okay, uh, in cases where you may have a higher dimensional function, so maybe you have more than two variables on the right-hand side of that equation, uh, we can generalize this. Okay, and in this case, if you have you know, an n-dimensional function with n coordinates, uh, then your gradient vector would have n partial derivatives as the coordinates, a partial derivative with respect to each one of the coordinate directions. And so that is the gradient vector. Now, a few important properties of the gradient vector that we discussed in a previous segment uh, was that the gradient vector points in the direction of steepest ascent relative to the set of coordinates at which you are evaluating the function's gradient. Okay, um, what that means is we can use the gradient's direction as somewhat of a guide if we're thinking about whether or not we want to move up the function in the case of a maximization problem or down the function in the case of a minimization problem. And in the case of a three-dimensional function, we were using the idea of uh, level curves, right? This topological contour map, if you will, to think about uh, how we describe the gradient vector in a subset of that three-dimensional space in a two-dimensional mapping projection, right? That topological map. And the three-dimensional case, I think, is very useful for illustrative purposes. But the uh, thing I would like to emphasize in this moment uh, is that everything we're going to talk about in this segment applies generally, even to cases where you have more than two choice variables in your optimization problem. So, this algorithm here doesn't just work in three dimensions, it works in higher dimensionalities as well. All right, so this is a very general application, but to understand the algorithm visually, uh, we're gonna use this three-dimensional representation of our three-dimensional function, uh, which is easy for us to graph and to look at. So uh, I wanted to come back to this idea that we could think of the level curves of a function uh, in three dimensions as the topological map Right, so what we're doing here is we're taking a three-dimensional representation in the picture above, okay, and we're projecting that below into two-dimensional space. This picture, we're kind of flattening it out. We're projecting it down, we're kind of smashing it. And you can see here when we do that, all of these uh, level curves, it looks like these lines around the function that measure uh, points that fall in the same elevation, these level curves that we can see up here, they map down to this function that we can observe below. And that is the level curve for 1200 elevation. And that is the one that we were looking at up here. Um, so the level curves, they give us this important, eleva uh, el uh, this important information related to the, the elevation of the function, or at least the value in that vertical uh, z-axis direction. So our z-axis here, uh, you can think points in this direction. We also have a y-axis that points in that direction and an x-axis that points in this direction. So those are our three dimensions. And we can see here that specifically the topological contour map is a projection into a two-dimensional space, into the xy plane here, right? We've smushed everything in the z-direction down to the xy plane.
Uh, and it is very useful to think about the gradient vector in this two-dimensional projection shown in the uh, bottom diagram here. So again, remember, if we were to pick a point on this map and evaluate the gradient, okay, the gradient is going to tell us in which direction we would move up the mountain the fastest relative to that point. Okay. So this is the direction to move in, given a particular point that's going to increase our elevation most rapidly. Now, you might be thinking, well, in machine learning, our goal is not to maximize the cost function. It's to minimize our cost function, our error function. Um, and we'll be able to do that momentarily, but you can actually use the gradient descent algorithm to solve both min and max problems. In the max problem framework, you're really doing a gradient ascent, like we're looking at in this picture here. Um, so we'll be able to flip things around in just a moment. Uh, but if you were to consider a position in this map, like let's look at the top in three dimensions. Suppose we're located here, okay, where that red X is right at an elevation of 1100 along that level curve. Okay, what we should be able to do is look straight down and project that same point down into our contour map. Okay, so these two points here, they are the same. And one is just a projection downward into that contour map. And if we were to evaluate the gradient vector at this point in our contour map, if we evaluated the gradient vector at this point that we just drew here, okay, then the gradient vector would point in the direction of steepest ascent. So it would point in the direction that moves us towards the top of that mountain as quickly as possible. So in this case, the gradient vector would point in this direction. And that would move us in the top diagram up the mountain that way. Okay, and we could do this by checking some other points as well. Suppose our position was not there, but suppose our position was here, right at the base of the mountain. And we want to be able to, again, map that position down into the contour map and think about the gradient vector and telling us which direction we want to walk in that contour map. And again, the gradient vector is going to point in the direction of the steepest ascent right towards that maximum value, towards the top of that hill. Uh, so the gradient vector is going to point in this direction. That is the gradient vector in that topological map, that xy space. Okay, that is it. Okay. Uh, and if we move in this direction, what does that do? Well, that has us go up the mountain in the top picture in that direction. Right? It moves us up in that direction towards the peak. Okay, we could also, let's just do this one more time, pick a third point. Suppose we pick this point over here that's around the back side of the mountain. That's why it's a little bit transparent there. Okay, if we map that point down into our topological map underneath, there it is. Okay, and again, the gradient vector is going to point in the direction we should walk in that bottom map in that XY plane to move us as rapidly as possible towards the top. So the gradient vector for this point is here. And it moves us towards the top as rapidly as possible from that location. It moves us up the mountain that way from the far side. Okay, so in the case of a maximization problem, right, the gradient vector will be useful in guiding us towards the maximum. Okay, but in the case of a minimization problem, we're going to want to do exactly the opposite of that. We're going to want to move in the opposite direction of the gradient from any given point. So it's still a very useful guide, whether or not it's a maximization problem you're solving or a minimization problem. Uh, here's an example that we had looked at before. Uh, this was an example where our function was uh, x squared plus y squared equals z. This was the equation of a circle in two dimensions. In three dimensions, it looks like this, uh, this bowl that we have pictured in the right-hand diagram here. Um, and, uh, this problem is associated with a minimization problem. This is more within the framework of cost min, right? We know the cost minimization problem involves us trying to climb to the bottom of this hyperdimensional bowl by finding the optimal parameters. Okay, so we'll switch to that notation in a minute. But we have this three-dimensional function that we're looking at in the right-hand diagram. And we have the associated two-dimensional contour map on the left given by us slicing that function horizontally or looking at different values of that function along the z-axis uh, for a particular set of elevation points. And what we can see here is the following. We're going to take a look at the three-dimensional function. We're going to think about this point right here. Okay, it looks like it's a point on the first level curve. And you'll notice the axes of the three-dimensional function is a little bit rotated. 
compared to the diagram on the left. So at this point in three dimensions, we can identify that on our topological map, right? That's on that first ring of that function. It's on that first level curve, kind of right smack in the middle between the uh, positive X axis and the negative Y axis. So that point is right here. Okay, these two points, same. Okay, now where does the gradient vector point? The gradient vector points in the direction in the left diagram that is gonna move us as quickly as possible up that bowl. It's gonna move us up the bowl, kind of uh, towards us and up, all right? And the gradient vector here, if you were to draw the tangent line to the level curve at that point, the gradient vector does point perpendicularly to that. So this red arrow here, this is the gradient vector at that point. And it's telling us we should move in that direction if we want to move up the function most rapidly. And if we do move in this direction where the gradient is pointing, what happens? Well, we move in the right diagram up the bowl on the front side. Move up the bowl on the front side there. Okay, we can think about choosing another point. Let's take a look at this point. Uh, so this point right here on the right diagram that is flashing right now, that lies right along the y-axis. It's a little tricky to see that, but you can kind of see it's on a dotted line on that bowl, on that three-dimensional function. It lies right along the x-axis. Uh, and you'll notice it's a little transparent because it's on the far side of the bowl from our perspective. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and plot that point. That point falls right along the y-axis uh, and it falls on the second level curve. It's on that second ring up here. So this point in our topology diagram, in our level curves diagram in the XY plane here, that is right here. Okay. So these two points, these are the same point. Okay. One is just a projection of the other into the XY space. And if we were to take a look at this point in the left diagram in the contour map, Okay, again, we can compute the gradient here, uh, but it's easier to see visually by, again, drawing that tangent line and then drawing the gradient vector perpendicular to that tangent line. Okay, and that tangent line is tangent to the level curve at this particular point. Uh, so this is saying we want to move in this direction if we want to climb up out of that bowl. We want to move in that direction from that coordinate as rapidly as possible. And if we do that, Okay, then we would wind up moving around the, up the backside of that bowl, but right along the y-axis. So we wind up moving up there in that direction. And that is the direction we would want to walk if we wanted to climb up the bowl as quick as possible. Uh, our goal momentarily is going to be to do the opposite. It's going to be to climb down the bowl, and hopefully you're thinking about how we would use the gradient vector to guide us, right? And maybe just look at the opposite direction the gradient is pointing. Uh, so we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, let's look at one more point here, uh, kind of on the back side of the bowl in the right diagram. That is right along the x-axis here. You'll notice it's a little bit higher up. It's on that third disk, that third level curve. So if we were to slice that function and project that coordinate down into xy space, we would see this point here. Okay, in the left diagram, that corresponds to this point in the right diagram. So these points correspond to each other. The one in the left diagram is projected downward into the xy coordinate space relative to the one in the right diagram. And we can do the same thing. Okay, we can draw that tangent line to that level curve. And then we can look at the gradient vector, okay, which is perpendicular to that tangent line. Now, um, if we were to move in that direction, okay, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to move along the x-axis and we're going to move up the function okay, in the left diagram in this direction, that is where we are moving. Up that function, climbing out of the bowl as quickly as possible. Uh, so these red vectors here, these are the gradient vectors. In the previous segment, I drew these anchored at the origin. I had a line from the origin out to the coordinate point defined by the gradient in the numerical example. But remember, you can pick the vectors up, you can move them head to tail to a particular point. So that's what's done in this diagram. We're thinking about the gradient vector originating at the coordinate point and then pointing in the direction that moves us in the steepest ascent, moves us up that function as quickly as possible. 
Um, so just a few things about this graphical example. Uh, you might notice that there are a few features here in the diagram um, on the left. These are not coincidence. The gradient vector is perpendicular to the tangent line to the coordinate at the level curve, right? So we look at the tangent line at the coordinate on a level curve and the gradient vector will be tangent to that. Okay, the other thing you'll notice here is as we moved farther away from the minimum, okay, something happened to the gradient vectors and that is they got a little bit bigger. The gradient vector started pretty small here. It gets a little longer here in magnitude and it's the longest here. Okay, and that is also not a coincidence. Um, the gradient vector has a larger value as we tend to move away from an optimum, from a maximum or a minimum. Okay, well, what happens then if we're at the center of this target, if we're right at the minimum, the bottom of the bowl? Well, if you think about what the gradient vector measures, right, the gradient vector uh, is really measuring the slope. It's the derivative of that three-dimensional function, but in the x direction is the x coordinate and the y direction is the y coordinate. And if we're at the minimum or the maximum of a function, then the slope in all directions is going to be equal to zero. And that is exactly what the gradient is measuring. It is measuring the slope in every direction of coordinate space that we are dealing with. If we have uh, you know, two dimensions to deal with in terms of our choice variables x and y, and then we have to have two coordinate directions for the gradient vector. Um, so the point being here, uh, and this is gonna help us think about informing our stopping rule, but when we get near the optimum, the gradient starts to get smaller. And at the optimum, the gradient actually vanishes. Okay? And it becomes the zero vector. Because remember, at the optimum, the partial derivative with respect to x is going to be zero. Right? In the x direction, the function is flat. Same thing. In the y direction, the function is flat. And you can see that here. right? In the y plane, right? the function is flat okay? right at the minimum point. And in the x plane, the function is also flat. Okay, so at the minimum, the gradient vanishes. Uh, so a useful stopping rule that we'll see later is if we were to take the gradient and take the dot product of itself or gradient transpose the gradient, right? The sum of the squared coordinates of the gradient, that will give us a measure that we can use to say when we should think about exiting our uh, iterations okay? using the gradient descent algorithm. If that uh, gradient vector becomes small enough, becomes close enough to the zero vector in all coordinate directions, and the dot product of it with itself, the sum of its squared coordinates should also be really, really small. Uh, so we will come back to that idea. Uh, now, we discussed this in a previous segment, but the bisection method, it was kind of a simpler version of gradient descent. It applied here in one dimensional choice variable space, it's pretty easy to use. Uh, the gradient descent algorithm will allow us to do the same thing essentially, but in higher dimensions with a slightly different update rule. Okay, but the algorithm functions very similar with respect to the bisection method in that the cost function slope information is going to be really still the key thing that we're going to use to guide the update rule, okay, to guide us through that contour map of level curves at every iteration. Um, so in terms of our context, right, instead of a general multivariate function now, we're going to be thinking about dealing with a cost function that depends on, let's say, the values of k plus one independent variables. This is like a regression model where we have k independent variables and a slope parameter. Right? So we have k, uh, sorry, k slope parameters and an intercept term to assess here. So now we're thinking instead of z, we have the cost function as a function of the beta vector where each coordinate of that cost function right, is a uh, value of the coordinates that we're trying to estimate. And in the case of a three-dimensional situation, uh, we would see something like this, right? We have this three-dimensional bowl. And what we're trying to do here is climb to the bottom of that bowl by figuring out the correct estimates, uh, beta zero and beta one star, right? We want to find these estimates that put us right at the bottom of that function here in the beta zero, beta one plane, just like we were doing in the xy plane earlier. Um, now, if we considered a specific case of a linear regression model with an intercept term and a slope, just one intercept term and one slope. So this is a univariate 
regressor case, one regressor with a slope term, then we would literally have two parameters to estimate. I'd have beta zero, the intercept, I'd have beta one, the slope. So we could then think about actually drawing this function in three dimensions. This picture here corresponds to this particular situation where I only have two parameters to estimate. If we have more than two, we have a higher dimensional function. I can't really draw that uh, in a two dimensional um, pane here. Uh, and the objective function, again, is to minimize the cost function. So our three-dimensional function here, that is the cost function. Okay, the objective problem, right, described visually in this right-hand diagram, is to choose these optimal beta vectors by minimizing the cost function, right? There's our optimal value of B0. Here's our optimal value of B1. And again, you'll see where X marks the spot in the B0, B1 plane, in that beta 0, B1 plane. If we were to move straight up from that point in that plane, we would literally hit the very bottom of that bowl, the bottom of that three-dimensional bowl. Um, so that is the idea. If we're at the optimum, and then we know the gradient vanishes, the derivative in the B0 direction would be zero. No pun intended there. Um, so the function's flat in the B0 direction. It is also flat in the B1 direction at that minimum. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the main idea behind the gradient descent search algorithm here. At any given iteration, okay, the gradient of the cost function with respect to the particular coordinates we are at uh, is going to, for us, point in the direction that we don't necessarily want to go with points in the direction that increases the cost function most rapidly. Right? So recall our goal is not to increase the cost function. We don't want to climb out of the bowl at the top. We want to try to uh, climb to the bottom of the valley, or we want to try to find the bottom of the bowl, the bottom of that cost function. Um, so our goal is really to minimize, right? not maximize, uh, which means we don't want to walk in the same direction that the gradient points in that contour map. We actually want to walk in the opposite direction to where the gradient points. Okay, and hopefully you remember from our discussion of vectors earlier on in the course that if you have a vector and you negate all of its coordinates, okay, you take the negative of that vector, and the negative of that vector points in the exact opposite direction, okay, meaning if we wanted to walk in the opposite direction, we're going to walk in the direction where the negative of the gradient vector is pointing. Okay, that is really the main idea behind the gradient descent algorithm. We find a coordinate guess. We want to update the guess to move us closer to the optimal set of parameters. Okay, so we're going to look at the gradient and we're going to face the opposite direction and we're going to go the opposite direction of the gradient, which is the direction of the negative gradient. Uh, if we were dealing with a maximization problem, okay, this is an exception here, then we would want to move in the same direction of the gradient vector and we would be uh, engaging in a slightly different version of this algorithm called gradient ascent or increasing the value of the function rather than descending into the bottom of it. Uh, and it's important to note here that you can always just negate the objective function to convert a max problem into a min problem and vice versa. If I wanted to minimize the function x squared, which we know happens at zero, I could rewrite that as a maximization problem by saying, let's maximize negative x squared. Um, uh, and it will have the same solution. So you can always re-specify a minimization problem as a maximization problem and vice versa. You can re-specify a maximization problem as a minimization problem, meaning you don't really have to worry about gradient descent and ascent separately, right? We can always write the max problem as a min problem and always apply gradient descent uh, to any maximization problem by rewriting it and negating the objective function and changing max to min. Okay, now, um, in terms of how this algorithm is going to work, the important element for us is really going to be how the update rule functions. So we're going to consider a particular guess of the parameter vector of that beta vector at iteration t. So I'm going to use that t subscript here to denote the iteration in the algorithm that we are uh, at. And if you want to update our guess and move closer to the minimum of the cost function right, and away from the maximum, right, move down the function, we need to move in the direction that is opposite the gradient vector. We need to move in the direction of the steepest descent. And we know the gradient points in the opposite direction, the direction of steepest ascent. So the way we're going to do that uh, is we're going to take our guess and we're going to add 
the negative gradient vector to it. Uh, hopefully the other thing you remember from our discussion of vectors, and we talked about this in the Netflix example we looked at towards the beginning of the course, but if I have two vectors and I add them together, the result of that, like if I have, this is my, uh, let's say my initial guess, and here's my update rule. And here my, my update vector, the vector in the direction that I want to move. If I add those vectors together, the resulting vector okay, was in between, moved closer to my new vector that I had added. Okay, and that's essentially what we're going to wind up doing here. Okay, we're going to take our original guess, right, the beta vector at iteration t, and then we're going to add to it the direction we want to move in. And that direction uh, involves us adding a negative value of the gradient. And we're actually not going to just add the gradient. We're going to specifically add a scaled version of it. Remember, if we're very far away from the optimum, the gradient's really big. I mean, we're going to wind up taking a really big step towards it. So we typically scale the step size down uh, using what we call a learning rate parameter. And I'll mention that in just a moment. Uh, so the update rule here that we're going to look at is the following. In order to generate my best guess in iteration t plus one, we're going to take our guess at iteration t. Okay, here is our guess at iteration t. And we're going to take that guess and we're going to say, hey, let's add a negative scale. So this eta term is a scaling parameter, smaller than one. And we're going to multiply that scaling parameter by the gradient vector. But note we have a negative sign here. So we're taking bt. Right? We're taking beta t, our initial guess, and we're adding to it the negative gradient vector, which means our updated guess is going to be pointed more in the direction that we're supposed to be pointed in. Okay, so this term eta here, this Greek letter, okay, this thing is what we refer to as the learning rate. And the learning rate itself, uh, we usually pick a pretty small number, close to like 10%, 0.1, sometimes even smaller than that. Uh, but the learning rate, what that does uh, is together with the gradient, when you multiply those two things, okay, we generate what is referred to as the step size. So these two terms together essentially denote how much difference there's going to be between the guesses at each iteration. It tells us how much we're jumping between coordinates at each iteration. Um, so together with the gradient, okay, the magnitude of that step size here, okay, is going to tell us how big of jumps we're making on that contour map every time we update our guess. And there's a couple problems you can run into here. If you make that step size way too small, yeah, that means you're taking tiny steps every iteration to update. It's going to take your algorithm a very, very long time to converge to the optimum. Okay, provided, of course, it's well-defined. We saw there's other problems potentially with nonlinearities and multiple optima. We'll talk about that in the next segment or in a later segment when we uh, discuss uh, batched and stochastic gradient descent. Um, now, the other problem you can run into is you could make eta too big. Okay, where you, you jump too far, you jump, you take a step at the update and you jump past where you wanted to be. You wanted to be here okay, and you wound up jumping past it okay, because the step size was too big. So if you're running the gradient descent algorithm and you run into either of those two problems, convergence has taken way too long to happen, it's way too slow, okay, it could be that your learning rate is too low. You're taking too small of steps. Okay, but if you see that your cost function at every iteration starts to explode, it starts to get really big because you're maybe taking too big of steps back and forth and you're actually climbing up the bowl and out instead of down, then that could be a sign that your learning rate is too large. Okay, so that learning rate, it's an important parameter. It determines along with the gradient, the step size, and we can scale that step size up or down by changing that learning rate, eta, up or down. Um, so let's go ahead and let's wrap up this video by looking at the gradient descent in full. So first step of any algorithm is the initialization step. And initialization for gradient descent is a little bit different than bisection method. We don't actually need to pick upper and lower bounds uh, 
because if we had to do that, we would have to do that for every single dimension and that's a little bit tedious. So all we do in the gradient descent algorithm here is we choose an initial guess for the parameter vector. Okay. Some initial guess. You can set this randomly, however you want really. Uh, generally we avoid choosing the zero vector as the initial guess, but um, you, know, you could get, get away with that in certain cases. Uh, so this is the initialization. We make some initial guess completely uninformed. Okay, so we pick a coordinate on the contour map to start at, and then we move into our iterations. And once we pick a point in the contour map, at every iteration, we're gonna compute the gradient. Okay, so this is us using the slope information of that function. Right? The slope information of that function is contained in every coordinate of the gradient. Slope in the B0 direction, slope in the B1 direction, so on and so forth. Uh, and once we've computed the gradient at that iteration, then we're going to go ahead and apply our update rule. And the update rule is in the next iteration, t plus one, we're going to take our guess at iteration t and we're going to add that negative scaled gradient vector, right, using that learning rate as a scaling factor. So that is the update rule here. We're not bisecting anymore and moving the goalposts, slightly different update rule, but we're still using the slope information. We're still using the slope information to guide us in our update, right? The slope, that gradient is showing up right here. Um, um, so we update and uh, we can check the stopping rule and you can actually, it doesn't really matter which order you check the check the stopping rule before you update or afterwards doesn't really matter because if you're going to stop, right, if you meet that stopping rule criteria, then we're going to report the current parameter vector as the solution and we will exit those iterations. Okay, and I mentioned before the stopping rule in this case uh, that might be useful is to look at uh, the gradient dot product with itself where you take each, uh, again, each coordinate of the gradient, you square, you add it up, Okay, and if the gradient's close to zero, that thing should be close to zero. Okay, so just like we had u transpose u is like the sum of square residuals, the gradient dot product itself is the sum of square coordinates of the gradient. Uh, so one useful stopping rule here is to exit the iterations when the norm of the gradient um, or the sum of the squared uh, coordinates of the gradient is sufficiently smaller than that value epsilon, the error tolerance. Uh, if we do not meet that stopping rule criteria, then we go right back to step two. We repeat with the updated guess, and we keep moving through this iterative process that is gradient descent. Uh, so that is the gradient descent algorithm. Um, we're gonna build on that a little bit more when we talk about logistic regression uh, in a later segment. Hope that was informative and stay tuned.